All right, we are live. This is Sound Booth Theater Live. Thank you guys for coming and hanging out with me. I hope that the uh, audio is working out all right. One sec, let me get my headphones. I forgot. So there's a... Uh, every, every first Wednesday of the month, they, they test the alarms, the emergency alarms. I think it's for tornadoes. And, uh, they're doing that right now. I can't really hear it though. I feel, I feel it's actually pretty good. I can't hear it. Um, oh, you know what? I'm going to move this panel here. There we go. That should help a little bit with reflection. Um, how's everybody doing? Dustin Wells is here. Tristan Christenberry is here. What's up, Tristan? Ah, uh, good. Caleb Campbell. Yeah, I can't hear him either. I'm I'm feeling good and uh, isolated here. Randy Moore, good to see you. RWS RWDS engineer. Xylo Art, thanks so much for coming, guys. Really appreciate it. Hope you guys enjoy the show. Um, let's go ahead and get some narration socks applied here. Um, for anyone who is aspiring to narrate, be sure that your feet are co <laughs> be sure that your feet are covered while you're narrating. This is essential to my technique. And uh, it will help you guys too. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Tristan says. So uh, we are starting on chapter one today. Um, chapter one, part one of Everybody Loves Large Chests, volume 10. That is law. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm. I'm pretty sure it's uh, named after the character Sigmund Law, who is the champion of uh, Teresa, who is the goddess of justice, I believe, and a few other things. Um, Haven Cardell asks, Hey Jeff, I noticed that the Legend of Zero books got taken off Audible. Are those coming back, or do I need to get those through your app? Thanks for all the great narration. They are available through the app soundbooththeater.com you can find a shit ton of um content from sarah king there that's uh sarah king has um decided to go exclusive to our platform and she decided that because you know she's tired of audible so i i mean i really appreciate it anyone who's a fan of hers please tell other fans of sarah king that that's the only place to find her audiobooks uh, we have three full novels of The Legend of Zero. We have one smaller novel, which I actually consider a novel on its own. It's more than 60,000 words, which a novella is like 30,000, I think. So I, I think it is novel-sized. Um, and then there's plenty of short stories in the same series. We also have Vampire Queens 1 and 2. We have... Um, uh, Alaskan Fire and Alaskan Fury. Those are both sort of urban fantasy kind of romances set in Alaska. Um, and then we have a bunch of her Tales from the Battered Mind, a uh, bunch of short stories that she wrote that we've had narrated, and they're all free at the moment. I think um, that won't be the case for long, so if you have not already checked out Tales from the Battered Mind, now is the time to do so. Um, also, before I get started, make sure you guys check out the Dungeon Crawler Carl Audio Immersion Tunnel. The first episode is free. It is available. It's on our website, soundbooththeater.com. Three hours of a full cast sound effects and music reboot of the Dungeon Crawler Carl series. And the episode two comes to uh, is releasing October 31st, and we'll be releasing another episode every two weeks after that. So... Um, definitely 
get started on that. Uh, the production is amazing. We've spent so much time and energy on it. Um, it's all coming together and it's all amazing. Um, so far, the response has been incredible. Uh, check out the reviews if you if you don't believe me. Uh, we have a reviewing um, system on our website as well, so you can find it there. Um, and yeah, uh, check out episode one. It's free. If you like it, you can you can pre-order the rest of the season, or you can just wait for each episode to come out and buy them that way. Up to you. Um, Critical Quality says he's already pre uh, pre-ordered the next three releases. So thank you so much, Critical Quality, for that. Really appreciate it. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy them when they do come out. And, oh, yeah, you guys should check out the covers. So we just recently updated the cover for Episode 5. Um, you can find each episode's cover on, on our website when you go look at the season. We still... Episode 6's cover is almost done. We're basically just waiting for the typography before we post it up there. Um, but, uh, yeah, Episodes 1... One through five all have covers, so episode seven and eight will also have covers, but uh, they haven't. We haven't started on those yet, but they'll be coming. So that's another cool thing to keep track of. If you guys want to keep coming back to the product pages, take a look at them. You'll find uh, the new covers on there, and you'll be able to guess what happens in that episode with with uh, with that cover. So um, anyway. Yeah, let's get started on some Everybody Loves Large Chess. Oh, well, I'm sorry. One more thing I should be hawking to you guys right now. Small chests are fine, too. That is uh, that is exclusive to our platform. You cannot find Small Chests are Fine, too, on Audible. Um, that is, for those of you who don't know, who but who might be interested in Everybody Loves Large Chests, Small Chests are Fine, too, is a spinoff uh, starring the... Um, the shiniest of shinies, Fizzle, uh, Fizzy, Fizzy Rustblood, uh, the golem, and she for and also for those of you who don't know, Dory Sachs has replaced me as uh, as Fizzy, and she did a fantastic job actually narrating the entire uh, cinematic audio and audiobook for. Um, for small chests are fine too. So you can go to our website. You can get the standard audiobook, which is still multicast. It's still me and Justin and Annie and uh, Dory and Gary, I believe Gary Furlong. Um, but then we have the full ca full sound effects and music version. The cinematic audio version is available as well. You can get the whole series on our website. So um, yeah, go check that out, guys. All right. So, let's get into Chapter 1, Questionable Origins. This is Everybody Loves Large Chests, Volume 10. If you want to get the, uh, if you want the um, uh, Kindle version of this book, the description, uh, the link is in the description below. And he's actually, Naven just recently published uh, Volume 11 as well, Tulsa Roth, so... Uh, if you're really dying to know what happens, go check that out as well. Um, we're not going to start production on that one till next year, um, but it will be early next year. So, man, I don't want the series to end. We're so close. We might f like it. Seems like volumes eleven and twelve are coming out next year, and then we're done. Um, which makes me very sad. Honestly, I just love everybody loves large chests. Uh, but you know, Naven still has a bunch of stuff, right? Um, Stars Have Eyes is also another cinematic audio that we've already done. The entire uh, series is complete on that one. 15 episodes for that. Uh, that's on our website. And um, he has new stuff. He has actually two other new series um, that we would like to be working on very soon. So the the Legend of Sound Booth Theater plus Naven Ilyev does not stop at Everybody Loves Large Chests. You'll be able to find more um, soon. So, anyway, here goes. Chapter 1. Questionable Origins. Part 1. Fizzy exited Castle Aaron's main keep in an infectiously good mood. 
Between the sleek shininess of her service mode, the excited smile upon her metal lips, the spring in her step, and the strangely adorable way she was hugging her oversized red wrench, damn, little oversized red wrench, the spring in her step, <clears throat> between the sleek shininess of between the sleek shininess of her service mode, the excited smile upon her metal lips, the spring in her step, and the strangely adorable way she was hugging her oversized red wrench, she was a sight for sore eyes. She, she was a sight for sore eyes. It certainly brightened the day for the adventurers and soldiers stationed at this forward operating base. They'd been fighting the disorganized remnants of the orcish rampage for weeks, and it would be a long while before they were done mopping them up. The immediate threat of the natives of Velos had been quelled, but there were still a lot of greenskins. The immediate... The immediate threat to the natives of Velos... The immediate threat... The immediate threat to the... The immediate threat to the natives of Velos had been quelled, but there were still a lot of greenskins around. As if that weren't depressing enough, a few were privy to the not-yet-public information that one of the Bone Shaper's underlings was involved in this mess. Let's try that again. As if that... As if that weren't depressing enough. As if that weren't... As if that weren't depressing enough, a few... As if that weren't depressing enough, a few were privy to the not-yet-public information that one of the Bone Shaper's underlings was involved in this mess. Even after the remo The remoming... Even after the roaming orcs were reduced to normal, even after the roaming, even after the roaming orcs were reduced to normal levels, they still had to deal with this blight lord Alistair. Even after the roaming orcs were reduced to normal levels, they still had to deal with this blight lord Alistair. Oof. to clean my glasses. Critical Quality says, I can't wait to listen to more. You guys did a phenomenal job in the first one. It's almost criminal. You're offering the first one for free. Well, thank you, Critical Quality. I always love to be accused of uh, criminal activity. Um, but yeah, it's worth it to us, you know, f for for people to just give it a shot. You know, any... The thing is, most of the people we're trying to sell this to is people that have already listened to the entire Dungeon Crawler Carl series in classic audio. So, um, so you know, to convince them to give it another listen in, with a different version, I think it's I think it's important that we give give them the the option to check it out for free. And the fact is, we have so many pre-orders now; it's it's pretty clear that the people who do listen to it love it. Um, so. Kringle Bert Fishty Bun says, I'm so behind in my journey with Boxy, I am on book five. I honestly am a little bit envious that you get to still listen to it, you know, for the first time. From you, even if you're on book five, you're like, we just basically started with the full production. Um, man, I am so proud of the production of Everybody Loves Large Chests and, and the evolution of it. Um, you know, I think it would be cool if we did cinematic versions of books one through three. Um, but, um, anyway, if you guys would like to hear cinematic versions of books one through three of ELLC, please let us know. Please let me know in the, in the chat here because I'd, I'd love to produce them, you know, like, yeah. Um, so let's see. What microphone do I use? Randy Moore asks. It is a... Telefunken C12. Yeah. Alistair. <laughs> Where do I put the money? Yes. Uh, well, you know, I think, I think we'll work on it. We'll work on it. I'll, I'll talk to Naven about it and, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe after.
we could do a thing where it's like well we'll we'll have to look at the actual sales of books you know of the rest of the books um but you know when sales start to slow down for the whole series in general i think that's when it's time for us to do that maybe after volume 12 right okay under such depressing circumstances, a cute girl overflowing with... Under such... Under such depressing circumstances, a cute girl overflowing with joy skipping through the courtyard brought some much-needed levity to Castle Aaron's residence. Naturally, spreading good vibes was not Fizzy's intent, but she couldn't physically contain her giddiness. She had just received word that the enchantments she commissioned from now had turned out significantly better than she could have hoped. The hero of magic... Mm. She had just... She had just received word that the enchantments she commissioned from now had turned out significantly better than she could have hoped. The hero of magic managed to imbue her favorite tool-turned-weapon with all the additional magical properties she requested, and in doing so, officially boosted the item's quality rank to artifact. The golem was so ecstatic that she could barely control her electrical output. It spiked like crazy the moment she saw the post-enchantment appraisal results, causing the document in her hands to instantly combust. Thankfully, she had burned that information into her memory before it turned to ash, and thinking back to it was the source of her overflowing jubilation. Enchantment Order Number 164 Performed by Now Shoki Hero of Magic No Guild Affiliation Item Appraisal by Zack of Clan Vass Head Scribe to the Verdon Mist Guild Shield Titan's Wrath a novelty two-handed wrench repurposed to a bludgeoning weapon and repeatedly upgraded by Fizzy Rustblood. Of particular note is a mysterious device of unknown make and origin that grants it an unidentified innate ability. The weapon's solid titanium construction... The weapon's solid titanium construction allows it to withstand great impacts without suffering a single dent, and its dense mass allows for incredible striking force requires immense strength and skill to wield effectively. Original enchantments altered and expanded upon by Now Shoki. Type, Warmall. Quality, Artifact. Offensive Ability, Double A. Defensive Ability, C+. Durability, A. Magic Amplification, plus 20% Lightning, plus 5% Force. Enchantments, Recall. Impact Amplification, Greater Lightning Focus, Greater Cold Resistance, Major Enhanced Durability, Innate Ability. Estimated Value, Priceless. 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 Estimated Value, Priceless. Fizzy didn't even complain that her latest invention was reduced to a mysterious device of unknown make and origin. It couldn't be helped since it was common practice to have a third party perform the item appraisal once an enchanting order was finished. That duty had to be entrusted to the locals, and raptors were completely ignorant of Arclight Artificer technology. Artificer technology. Let's try that one more time. Or technology. Techno. Can I just... Artificer technology. Uh, I can't. I can't cheat on it either. That duty... That duty had to be entrusted to the locals, and raptors were completely ignorant of Arclight Artificer technology. It wasn't as if there hadn't been attempts to introduce... N it wasn't as if there hadn't been attempts to introduce gnomish tinkering to the southern continent, but this really wasn't the place for it. High humidity, rampant vegetation, overabundance of pollen, and countless bugs made it an ex... High humidity. High humidity, rampant vegetation, overabundance of pollen, and countless bugs made it an extremely hostile environment towards delicate devices and complex contraptions. Thankfully, the scribe's ignorance was of no concern, since Fizzy's latest addition to her wrench wasn't mysterious or unidentified to her. The ingenious construct had permanently incorporated her direct impact lightning discharge oscillator, 
the ingenious construct had permanently incorporated her direct impact lightning discharge oscillator into her wrench's construction. The device looked like a mithril donut adorned with a few small coils and was fused to the side of the tool near the base of its bottom teeth. It was connected to a metal plate bolted onto the business end with several wires. Its primary feature was a revolutionary arcane circuit that could store up to 2,000 MP of energy, if charged to at least a quarter capacity. If charged to at least quarter capacity, it could be primed with a trigger pull. The next significant impact the weapon made would release this energy in a burst of lightning and force. The stronger and faster the hit, the more focused the jolt. Fizzy's preliminary tests proved she could punch a finger-sized hole clean through in... Uh, damn. Fizzy's... Fizzy's preliminary... Fizzy's preliminary tests proved she could punch a finger-sized hole clean through unenchanted mithril... Fuck. Fizzy's preliminary tests proved she could punch a finger-sized hole clean through unenchanted mithril plating with a fully charged all-or-nothing swing. Conversely, a lighter blow would result in a wider blast ideal for crowd control, though not as lethal. At least, that was how the device performed before she handed it over to now. Since then, the addition of the greater lightning focus and imp... That was how the device... Since then... Since then, the addition of the greater lightning focus and imp... Since then, the addition of the greater lightning focus and impact amplification properties had boosted the weapon's offensive... Since then, the addition of the greater lightning focus and impact amplification properties had boosted the weapon's offensive rating to double A. In theory, this meant the weapon was now powerful enough to punch through a dragon's notoriously tough scales if Fizzy really put her back into it. If the first hit didn't do it, then the second, third, and fourth would finish driving that invisible nail in. If the first hit did... If the first hit... Into it. If... And if the first hit didn't do it, then the second, third, and fourth would finish driving that invisible nail in. The golem could fire the dil... The golem could fire the dildo as often as she liked, so long as she fed it enough MP, which she'd have an effectively infinite amount of once her engine of destruction was spooled up. Its output was also significantly higher than anything she could generate through static field since the energy would be stored and released in a single burst. Hey, Nevermore, good to see you again. Art Fisher, yes. Oh, thanks, Facebook user, who says, awesome to get to see you work. Big fan, awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. Single burst. All in all, it really was a weapon worthy of being called an artifact, and updating its name from Iron Teeth to Shielded Titan's Wrath was not at all premature or overly dramatic as far as Fizzy was concerned. Let's try it again. All in all, it really was a weapon worthy of being called an artifact, and updating its name from Iron Teeth to Shielded Titan's Wrath was not at all premature or overly dramatic as far as Fizzy was concerned. The new label was, for once, not a reference to a lofty moniker of the narcissistic construct's radiant self. The Shield Titan was an obscure mythological figure the pint-sized paladin learned of while researching metal golems. According to ancient myth, Titans were entities of godlike power that roamed the world before the advent of enlightened civilization. The one depicted with a shield was supposedly the most invulnerable of the lot and commonly associated with lightning and fire. Size aside, that was more or less how Fizzy imagined herself, so she enjoyed associating her favorite weapon. Size, as Size aside, that was more or less how Fizzy imagined herself, so she enjoyed associating her favorite weapon with that legend. Also, Shield Titan's Wrath sounded way cooler than Iron Teeth, which was something she came up with on the spot and stubbornly clung to even though it didn't really fit following the wrench's transmutation into titanium. 
All of that aside, Fizzy was eager to try out her new toy. She'd run a comprehensive battery of tests before handing it over for re-enchantment and couldn't wait to do them all again. Literally. She barely spotted a quartet of colorful birds flying overhead before she went into skirmisher mode right in the middle of Castle Aaron's busy courtyard. The nearby troops had no idea what had gotten into her, but wisely gave her plenty of space when they saw her two-handed grip on the wrench and the buzzing golden arcs leaping from her frame. The parrots she was glan- The parrots she was glaring at sensed the incoming danger and picked up their speed, which only motivated the golem to concentrate harder. Let's try that. Ah, shit. The, par the parrots she was glaring at sensed the incoming danger and picked up their speed, which only motivated the golem to concentrate harder. There was no such thing as too much target practice, after all. Once her weapon was fully charged, the mechanized paladin unleashed her least used technique. Hammer toss! The wrench was wrapped in a mix of golden lightning and the dull red. The wrench was wrapped in a mix of golden lightning and the dull red glow common to martial arts. The wrench was wrapped in a mix of golden lightning and the dull red glow common to martial arts as it was hurled skyward. The item spun around horizontally at such speed that it became disc shaped. The item spun around horizontally at such speed that it became a disc shaped blur. The poor birds barely had time to scatter and dodge out of the way before the improvised projectile was upon them. They might have succeeded if Hammer Toss didn't track its target. The rapidly spinning lump of titanium suddenly jerked to the left and instantly turned one of the parrots into mush. The minuscule impact was immediately followed by a spherical pulse of electricity that vaporized the other three, scattering their remains in all directions as a fine red mist. Its target eliminated and magic spent, the wrench's momentum continued carrying it off into the distance. It would have inevitably landed somewhere deep in the jungle if its recall property didn't trigger a few seconds later, causing it to teleport straight into its open... It, w it would have inevitably landed somewhere deep in the jungle if its recall property didn't trigger a few seconds later, causing it to teleport straight into its owner's open hand. Unfortunately, this was Fizzy's first time using it, and she failed to consider what position her hand was in, so she unintentionally slammed the artifact into the cobblestone path underfoot. All right, let's the wrench was... Need to make some marks. I forgot some marks. The nearby troops had no idea what had gotten into her, but wisely gave her plenty of space when they saw her two-handed grip on... Literally. She... Right away, she was made aware of the pocket dimension's all-encompassing heat. Happened to- But don't worry, your stuff will come back when you leave. Um, 
No, I'm the only one who has one of these on the team for sure. There's no way to upgrade from here. <laughs> this is this is about as much as you can spend on a mic. Yeah, Dory was, in my opinion, an improvement on the character. I think she's... I think Fizzy sounds even better now. So, kudos to Dory. Ah, oh, crap. Nearly chipped the paint. She grumbled quietly while inspecting her wrench. Guess I need to be a bit more careful with recall. And I forgot to restart my, uh, I forgot to restart Google Chrome so that I could screen share. Uh, but, oh well, next time. With recall. Can someone remind me before the stream ends? Like, right before the stream ends so I can do that and then next time I can, uh, I can screen share. <laughs> I love that. Yep. It is not a cheap mic. Recall. Maybe we should go ask Tony to give us some pointers. Plus suggested. No fucking way. Minus immediately rejected it. You have any idea how long it would take to get back to, to Skuna? Meatbag input is unnecessary. Null chimed in. Null chimed in. Live combat trials are the most efficient means of building expertise. I agree. Not worth it just for that. Can we go see Tony anyway? I kind of miss him. Eh. Might not be the worst idea, actually. Seriously, Fizzy? The negative personality scoffed. The negative personality scoffed. The negative personality scoffed. He's all right for a meat bag, but I was thinking of checking in with Crack and Crumb, see if they dug up any juicy bits of Katya's, Katya's old tech. Yay! Don't celebrate yet, plus. I haven't decided anything, but I am considering it. Works for me. Thanks, Fizzy. The golem continued walking and talking to herself, completely ignoring the startled and confused onlookers around. Normally she'd appreciate the attention, but she was still far too hyped about the upgrade to notice it. That was a promising first test, and she was eager for another. Sadly, there weren't any viable flying targets. Sadly, sadly, there weren't any viable flying targets. She had her eye on an Inquisition griffin coming in for a landing and wondered. <clears throat> she had her, she had, she had her eye, she had her eye on an Inquisition griffin coming in for a landing and wondered if it was worth aggravating the organization just to put her wrench through its paces. 
She quickly deduced it wasn't and started making her way back to Orr's rest. She saw no reason to... She saw no reason to dilly-dally, so she transformed into her assault mode as soon as she was out of Castle Aaron's outer walls and used her jump jets to dart from treetop to treetop. It wasn't the quickest method of traversing the Velocian jungle, but it was the cleanest. Along the way, she conducted a lot of Null's suggested live combat trials, which was a roundabout way of saying she mercilessly assaulted any monsters she came across, primarily orcs, wyverns, and hydras. Let me do something here. Primarily, orcs, wyverns, and hydras. and hydras. There we go. Sorry, I had to check something. All right. Hydras, 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 hydras. Where'd that go? Fizzy was disappointed to find out the damage numbers her status was reporting. Fizzy was disappointed to find out the damage numbers her status was reporting were more or less identical to the tests she'd run prior to the handle... Fizzy was disappointed to find out the damage numbers her status was reporting were more or less identical to the tests she'd run prior to handing the Shield Titan's wrath over to now. Fizzy was disappointed to find out the damage numbers her status was reporting were more or less identical to the tests she'd run prior to handing the Shield Titan's wrath over to now. She then realized she was doing all this in her assault mode, which didn't have as much raw power as her default form. She saw the expected increases once she reverted to her skirmisher configuration. That impact amplification thing really did the trick, just as now said. Fizzy originally wanted increased weight since it could achieve... Fizzy originally wanted increased weight since it would achieve more or less the same thing in terms of boosting her striking damage, though without the added benefits that came with greater momentum. However, that was a gravity-type enchantment, which could compromise the weapon's integrity if paired with the opposing spatial-type recall function. Damn. Fizzy er Which could... However, that was a gravity-type... However, that was a gravity-type enchantment, which could compromise the item's integrity if paired with the opposing spatial-type recall function. Fizzy really should have known about that, considering Boxy still occasionally bitched about the time now broke its favorite mithril dagger because of a similar situation, yet it completely slipped her mind. I'm gonna switch, I'm gonna change my angle just a little bit there. I think that's better. Yet it completely slipped her mind. Fortunately for the golem, the wolfkin certainly hadn't forgotten that incident and replaced Fortunately for the golem, the wolfkin certainly hadn't forgotten that incident and replaced increased weight with impact amplification to avoid a repeat. He even pulled a highly caffeinated all-nighter just to make sure the magic he wove into the transmuted metal was at a s Damn. He even he even pulled a highly caffeinated all-nighter just to make sure the magic he wove into the transmuted metal was as stable as possible. The relief he felt from Fizzy's approval was so overwhelming that he passed out from exhaustion as soon as she left, much as Kuro expected. The Hero of Magic already had his hands full helping Sigmund and Orin track down the Blight Lord. He wouldn't have taken that emergency enchantment job if Kira didn't practically beg him to help her shiny friend. Thankfully, it turned out so well that Now didn't even ask for any payment beyond reimbursement for the rare materials he used. Crap.
Minnick for president. <laughs> Agreed. Thanks, Ron Big. The rare materials he used. He really should have charged more, though, especially considering the urgency of the task. Fizzy had taken a while to perfect her dildo. The name stuck, despite her intentions, and wasn't able to get it to now until yesterday at noon. That gave the Hero of Magic only about twenty hours to finish a thirty-hour job before his client had to board a ship to Velos. It was extremely short notice, but as per usual, the boyish wolfman couldn't pass up a chance to work on such an exotic and curious article. Nor would Fizzy allow anyone else to touch it. Now was the only enchanter in the world who even knew... Now, now was the only enchanter in the world who even knew what titanium was, and that wasn't likely to change since the metal's only source was on a bloody moon. If he didn't get this done today, then Fizzy would have to wait either for the next Attica-bound ship or until the next time she and Lunar is chosen. If he didn't get... If he didn't get this done today, then Fizzy would have to wait for... If he didn't get this done today, then Fizzy would have to wait for either... If he didn't get this done today, then Fizzy would have to wait either for the next Attica-bound ship or until the next time she and Lunar's Chosen crossed paths. Both could take months, and that was far too inefficient for the golem's liking, so she forced the issue. All things considered, it was remarkable she walked away from such a rushed crafting process with an artifact, and she certainly had no illusions that a great deal of luck was involved. Fizzy just hoped that she hadn't used up all her good fortune on an inan- Fizzy just hoped that she hadn't used up all her good fortune on an inanimate object when she still had a notoriously treacherous voyage ahead of her. She later discovered luck would not be a factor for the return- she later discovered luck she later discovered luck would not be a factor for the return trip to Attica. Kira's group would make the trip aboard the SSS Teresa's judgment much as before, except this time the naval convoy was so large it was practically a fleet. While not as formidable since there were while not as formidable since there were far fewer adventurers on board, it didn't seem that way to the shimmering ocean's monster population. From their perspective, attacking an armada of that side would From their From their perspective, attacking an armada of that size would surely From their perspective, attacking an armada of that size would surely result in a swift, pointless death. So practically none tried. This made the voyage significantly less harrowing than the first. The vessel still had to contend with massive waves, powerful winds, impenetrable fogs, and terrible thunderstorms on a nearly daily basis. Damn. The vessel... The vessel still had to contend with massive waves, powerful winds, impenetrable fogs, and terrible thunderstorms on a near daily basis, but the unpredictable climate was far easier for the sailors to deal with than the beasts of the deep. Damn. The vessel still had to contend with massive waves, powerful winds, impenetrable fogs, and terrible thunderstorms on a near-daily basis, but the unpredictable climate was far easier for the sailors to deal with than the beasts of the deep. So it was, on the evening of the fifteenth day since leaving Orr's rest, the SSS Teresa's judgment finally returned to the Alliance port called Ambershore after over a month of absence. Most of the convoy dispersed to other destinations as soon as they hit the safety of Attica's con Most of Most of the convoy dispersed to other destinations as soon as they hit the safety of Attica's continental shallows, so they wouldn't need to wait in line to reach the docks. For sure, after over a month of absence.
Ah, finally, Kira grumbled. I don't want to see another ship as long as I live. Are you sure it's just the ship? Rowana asked, concerned. The two of them were currently atop the vessel's deck and leaning on the wooden railing along with most of the other passengers while the ship did its land... F the two of them... The two of them were currently atop the vessel's deck and leaning on the wooden railing along with most of the other passengers. The two of them were currently atop the vessel's deck and leaning on the wooden railing along with most of the other passengers while the ship did its final landing maneuvers. What do you mean? You've been really tense and on edge these past few days, but you weren't like this during the trip to Velos. Is there something besides travel fatigue bothering you? Ah, <sighs> Rowie, you're overthinking things, the cat girl reassured her. I'm just bored out of my skull. There was, like, nothing to bloody do during the entire trip, and there are only so many laps around the deck I can make before I start itching for something more. I'm not saying I wanted monsters to attack us, but it would have at least broken up the monotony. Do we really need to have this talk again? The elf pouted. The elf The elf pouted. The elf pouted. How are we supposed to settle down when you constantly run off on thrill-seeking whims? It's like you're allergic to peace and quiet. Quiet. Ah! I keep telling you it's not like that. Then why are you so jumpy? I just hate staying cooped up for so long. Makes me feel like a prisoner. Especially when I'm stuck in a tiny cabin on some rotten, godforsaken tub! Hub. Kindly mind your language, madam. A passing sailor called out to her. When you insult this fine vessel, you insult both her crew and the workers that put her together. Kira glared daggers at the nosy mariner giving him a none-too-subtle hint to buzz off if he fancied having all his limbs attached. The message was received loud and clear, prompting the deckhand to mumble an excuse before speed-walking away. It's attached. The message was received loud and clear, prompting the deckhand to mumble an excuse before speed <gasps> oh the message was received loud and clear, prompting the deckhand to mumble an excuse before... See? That's what I'm talking about! Rowana exclaimed. Rowana exclaimed. The look you gave that guy was so mean it even scared me. I said I'm fine, Rowie, the redhead insisted. I just need to stretch my legs a bit and I'll be back to normal, I swear. Fine. I won't push. Just know that I'll be here for you if you ever want to share what's eating you up inside. All right. I keep telling you you're overthinking it. Don't insult me, Kira. I may not be some big shot adventurer or, e or expert archer, but I can still tell when my wife is hiding something. There was an extended period of awkward silence before Rowana spoke up again. 
I should go get our luggage ready. Do me a favor and find where Minnick's gone off to, will you? Sure. Rowana gave her lover a peck on the cheek before slinking off back to their cabin. Rowana gave her lover a peck on the cheek before slinking off back to their cabin, leaving Boxy alone with its thoughts. It had to admit, it was both impressive and annoying how perceptive that woman could be sometimes. Though mostly annoying, something was profoundly bothering the shapeshifter, just as she sensed. It was so agitated that its anxiety kept bubbling to the surface of its facade despite its best efforts. It would impatiently tap its foot, twitch an eyelid, bite its lip, grind its teeth, scratch its arm, and otherwise nervously fidget. These involuntary ticks appeared sporadically and infrequently, but enough for the elf to take notice. It was honestly surprising she realized it, considering her head was full of nothing. It, it was honest. It was honestly surprising she realized it, considering her head was full of nothing but pink thoughts. Then again, those feelings were likely the reason why those little things stood out to her in the first place. Okay, I'm going to make a little more of an adjustment here with my mic. For some reason, it was not very tight anyway, so that's a good thing that I checked. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and get a... Well, no, I'll just, I'll finish off this part. How far are we in? Almost 20 minutes now. Ah, solid ground. How I missed you so. Kira exclaimed with arms raised when she finally set foot ashore. Kira exclaimed with arms raised when she finally set foot ashore. Excuse me. Rowie, I'm going to go for a run. Can I ask you to find us a room for the night? Sure. Just don't stay out too late. Won't be an issue. Should be back in an hour. Two tops. Catch you in a bit. With that, the cat girl sprinted down the pier, weaving through the crowd and their luggage with practiced ease. All right, so... Practiced ease. <clears throat> Rowana waved goodbye at her. Rowana waved goodbye at her until she was out of sight, then turned towards the mithril golem immediately next to her.
to her. Be honest. I'm not going crazy, am I? The elf asked. Fizzy, who was currently in her service mode and effortlessly pulling along the cart with all their luggage, looked up at her with a puzzled expression. You do realize who you're talking to, right? The paladin wasn't exactly known for her sanity. Though she was in full control of her faculties, it was hard to convince others of the same when she had three alternate versions of herself living inside her head. In fact, two of them were currently out and about helping carry the group's stuff, while the third was keeping a close eye on the couple's hyperactive pet jewelry box. I mean, Kira has been acting really weird as of l late, hasn't she? Rowana clarified. You two hang out and go adventuring all the time. Surely you've noticed something is off. She had indeed, now that the elf mentioned it. Boxy missed a spot while polishing her frame the day before. Though it was cosplaying as Kira at the time, it would never allow such a travesty to transpire unless it was distracted by something, like a matter weighing on its mind. Unfortunately, a crowded ship was not a safe place to ask potentially incriminating questions, so the golem had been unable to address the issue. She didn't worry too much, though, as the shapeshifter would have found a way to approach her discreetly if it was that big a deal. Even if she couldn't assist with resolving the issue, she could at least provide the creature with some comfort. Nevermore is so behind in the series, they're lost. When was the what was the last book you listened to, Nevermore? The last volume. It's probably one of those intrusive thoughts she gets hung up on, the paladin shrugged. Remember that time she was hung up on what would happen if the sun suddenly went dark? The elf winced when she thought back to that incident. Kira displayed increasingly erratic behavior for weeks before coming home with a box full of glowing soulless medallions she ordered because she wanted to be prepared for that absurd possibility. Try again. Kira dis- Kira displayed increasingly erratic behavior for weeks before coming home with a box full of glowing soulless medallions she ordered because she wanted to be prepared for that absurd possibility. Rowana wasn't even sure what happened to the enchanted... Is this... Can... There we go. It... Was it? Maybe it needs to do this? There we go. Rowana wasn't even sure what happened to the enchanted. Rowana wasn't even sure. Rowana wasn't even sure what happened to the enchanted trinkets after. Rowana wasn't even sure what happened to the enchanted trinkets afterwards since she never saw them again. Probably gathering dust in a corner of the basement. Hardly the best use of the household's funds, but at least the cat girl calmed down afterwards. Yes, Rowana is currently being played by Princess Donut. Three or four, wow. Nevermore, you are missing out on the crazy production. Book four is when we first started really doing increased production on, on the series, but like, Every, pretty much every volume after that turns it up just an extra notch. Until now, like, Jackson is like a fucking epic, crazy, ridiculous blockbuster fucking audiobook. Down afterwards. Besides, the golem continued, we both know she's not the type to keep quiet just to avoid worrying people. She'd speak up if it was anything worth raising a fuss over. Oh, right. Of course. I feel rather silly when you put it like that. Fizzy let out a breathless sigh. 
Covering for Boxy was neither her strong suit nor something she enjoyed. Thankfully, that mimic had rigorously trained its primary source of doppelganger XP to accept such corny sentiments at face value. Now, if only it could do something about that clingy and meddlesome side of hers. Now, if only it could do something about that clingy and meddlesome side of hers. I'm not sure what that means. By the way, we might want to book a carriage for tomorrow morning while we have the chance. Fizzy changed the subject. Fizzy changed the subject. We still have to pick up your new... We still have to pick up your new house guests on our way to Azure Vale, and I doubt there's a lot of people willing to take us across the Imperial border on short notice. I suppose that's a good point. I just wish Kira would have told me about that before we left. The new home had guest rooms, and this wouldn't be the first time they saw use, though the elf would have liked to chance... The... Their new home had guest rooms, and this wouldn't be the first time they saw use, though the elf would have liked the chance to prepare them... Ah. Their new home had guest rooms, and this wouldn't be the first time they saw use, though the elf would have liked the chance to prepare them in advance. Prepare them in advance. Damn it. Their new home had guest rooms, and this wouldn't be the first time they saw use, though the elf would have liked the chance to prepare them in advance. She would have if she knew. Law dumped the news on her out of nowhere. <sighs> well, here's hoping that guy at least, at least raised them right. I don't know what I'll do if they're a bunch of spoiled brats. Then again, Rowana didn't know much of anything about the girls in question, or their guardian, for that matter. She'd only been told that Kira promised one of her colleagues she would look after his nieces for a few months. It was far from the whole truth, but not entirely false. Ye wouldn't have to do anything. Kira would whip them into shape before you knew it. Fizzy pointed out. <laughs> I suppose having an adventurer instructor for a wife does have its perks. Though I do worry. I know she can get a bit harsh when she goes into hero mode, but... The elf looked around and leaned in, her voice almost a whisper. She doesn't literally whip people who misbehave, does she? Of course not. That would be ridiculous, the golem reassured her. The golem reassured her. She mostly just stabs them in non-lethal areas. Scars make for memorable lessons, or so I'm told. Of course! So, where did you say we needed to book a carriage to?
Hey, Flibster. Thanks for coming. Sorry, YouTube was a bitch to you. I think Donut and, and Boxy would actually get along. While the elf was trying her best not to think too hard about her future spouse's methods, the hero in question was busy skulking through Ambershore's seedier parts. Boxy had done away with its eye-catching facade the first time. Boxy had done away with its eye-catching facade the first chance it got and was now prowling around as a filthy-looking human pauper. While not the most pleasant of disguises, it was ideal for the grimy slum it was in. Even if it was spotted, even if it was spotted, nobody would bat an eye at another rag-covered, scruffy-looking man with a dead look in his eyes. The world's most dangerous hobo kept the world's most dangerous hobo kept circling the area in a methodical fashion, making sure to take every back alley and dingy side street it came across. After half an hour of wandering, the shapeshifter spotted a pair of sufficiently suspicious thugs. They were too well armed and, according to its eyes of the dead god, had too much HP to belong in this part of town, especially at this late hour. late hour. The sun had just set, and the only type of people that tended to stay out after dark were drunkards, thugs, and idiots. Admittedly, none of these things were mutual. Admittedly, none of those things were mutually exclusive, but these gentlemen stood s Admittedly, none of those things were mutually exclusive, but these gentlemen still stood out as sober individuals of ill repute. After silently trailing them for a bit, Boxy spied them entering a large building through a strangely well-maintained metal door. It stayed out of sight for several more minutes before ambling over while doing its best inebriated idiot impression. Upon creeping closer, its mana locator gland confirmed the entrance had been fortified by an anti-peaking enchantment, the same type that Reggie used to have in his office. The same type that Reggie used to have in his the same type that Reggie used to have in his office. King Enchantment, the same type that Reggie used to have in his office. Which, as far as the shapeshifter was concerned, was the same as having a giant, glowing sign that read, Wretched Den of Scum and Villainy. Which, as far as the shapeshifter was concerned, was the same as having a giant, glowing sign that read, Wretched Den of Scum and Villainy. As for what flavor of shady individuals made this place their home, that was simple enough to deduce. Like any major trade hub with an abundance of people and goods, the city-state of Ambershore had a considerable smuggler population. 
Boxy had dismantled a significant number of illegal operations as the Sandman, so it had developed a nose for such matters. Not that the monster had anything against criminals. If anything, it preferred to work with people who... Not that... Not that the monster had anything against criminals. If anything, it preferred to work with people who had no morals, since it made them more predictable. Those that systematically... Those that systematically broke the law also happened to make for good targets, since society at large would not be sad to see them gone, and they typically had stuff worth taking. And... And they typically had stuff worth taking. And they typically had stuff worth taking. These guys should prove no different, though it wasn't as if the monster targeted them specifically. They were simply unlucky enough to be the first scumbags to catch the impatient shapeshifter's notice. Gone, and they typically had stuff worth taking. The no, it would be boxy in boxy form. Yes, Flimster. Wretched den of scum and villainy would include Congress. I'm sure Congress has that same enchantment going on. But no, Donut would hang out with Boxy's Boxy self, not the um, not the uh, Kira version. <clears throat> Excuse me. After making sure nobody was around. After, after making sure nobody was around, Boxy quickly and quietly changed its disguise from random human beggar C to random elf bandit B. It was a nondescript, pointy-eared male, a stereotypical cut purse. It was a... It was a nondescript, pointy-eared male, a stereotypical cut purse right down to the face-concealing bandana and dark, baggy clothes. It proceeded to knock on the door, which, when translated... It, it proceeded to knock on the door, which, when translated from Mimicanese, meant it smashed it so hard the solid slab of enchanted steel flew clean off... Fuck. It proceeded to... It proceeded to knock on the door... Which, when translated from Mimicanese, meant it smashed it so hard the solid slab of enchanted steel flew clean off its hinges. A solid slab of enchanted steel flew clean off its hinges. The mangled door made a horrible racket as it splattered some poor soul against the far wall of the room beyond. It was so sudden and violent that the other three sentries inside barely even had time to process the shocking event before Boxy moved in and instantly ripped their heads off.
Hey, what's up, Lorraine? Thank you, Facebook user. Is cat tasty? <laughs> Um, oh yeah, I remember what I'm doing. Uh, what the? Okay. He ripped their heads off. <laughs> it's off. <laughs> off her <laughs> head's off <laughs> uh, my my booth blew up my booth just like it transformed it evolved into its new state so that's what you get for feeding it, for feeding it, uh, I feed it, uh, quinoa and, um, chinchilla meat. This flashy entrance naturally put the entire compound on high alert, and over a dozen hardened criminals arrived within seconds, never to be heard from again. Penetrating deeper into the hideout, the living calamity that walked like a man located a hidden trap door and descended through it into a series of underground tunnels. It effortlessly eliminated... It, eff it effortlessly eliminated six more guards before finally arriving at a secret subterranean grotto. The place had a deep saltwater basin, presumably connected to the ocean through an underwater passageway. So, you're the dipshit that's been raising all that racket, eh? So, you're the dipshit that's been raising all that racket, eh? What looked to be the boss of this gang called out to Boxy. What looked to be the boss of this gang called out to Boxy. Surprisingly enough, it was a fox-eared beastkin woman with a deep scar across her left cheek, a ranger by the look of her gear. It was likely she was an ultimate skill holder, as her HP was significantly higher than that of the other archers by her side. <clears throat> there were a total of thirty of these guys and gals, all pointing their arrows at the intruder from atop some sh There were a There were a total of thirty of these guys and gals, all pointing their arrows at the intruder from atop some shabby watchtowers. There were a total of thirty of these guys and gals, all pointing their arrows at the intruder from atop some sh there were a total of thirty of these guys and gals, all pointing their arrows at the intruder from atop some shabby watchtowers they'd built inside the spacious cavern.
Let's get this over with. Let's get this over with. Fortunately for them, Boxy wasn't in the mood to play around right now. Pin cushion him! Oh, that racket, eh? Pin cushion him! Yes, please buy from us. Please buy from our platform. We get better. Well, first of all, you get a better deal. Um, I think book one is seven ninety nine, and book two is eleven ninety nine. And two, we get more of that money than Audible. Well, we get Audible gets none of that money if you buy from us. So, cushion him. The leader, whose name the shapeshifter didn't even bother memorizing, ordered her men to open fire on the intruder. Their arrows rained down upon Boxy, though they merely bounced pathetically off its dense mana shield. The barrier would eventually crumble under a sustained barrage, but the shapeshifter only needed a few seconds. It tore off the baggy clothes covering its upper body, revealing the lean frame and pasty skin of a stereotypical twig. Dozens of monstrous eyeballs of various sizes appeared all over its torso in the next instant, each of them locked onto a different archer, after which Boxy unleashed an omnidirectional, petrifying gaze. The surreal sight caught the vast majority of the smugglers by surprise, and they were unable to look away as their bodies began to turn to stone. Some managed to deduce they were facing a basilisk's signature skill and shielded their faces, but they couldn't use their bows like that. With the arrows suddenly coming to a halt, Boxy dropped its barrier and unleashed a Windigo's cold snap. Boxy dropped its Boxy dropped its barrier and un Boxy dropped its barrier and unleashed a Windigo's cold snap. A wave of freezing energy radiated outwards, taking mere seconds to cover most of the chamber and all its occupants in a thin layer of ice. Reality Slash! Reality Slash! With most of their bodies either petrified or frozen, nobody could prevent the monster's chanting as it unleashed its favorite warlock spell. Ruinous Reach's extra range allowed it to land a hit on their boss all the way in the back, though not a direct one. The Foxkin Ranger had attempted to dodge... The Foxkin Ranger had attempted to dodge out of the way of the invisible guillotine... Nope. The Foxkin Ranger had attempted to dodge out of the way of the invisible guillotine at the last moment. Though she avoided a fatal wound, she still lost her left arm and left leg in the process, forcing her to writhe around atop her frozen perch, unable to do anything but scream bloody murder. REALITY SLASH! With most of their bodies either petrified or frozen, her lock spell. Ruinous reaches extra rain, though not a direct one. The Foxkin Ranger had attempted to dodge out of the way of the invisible guillotine at the last mo moment, though she avoided a fatal wound in the process, forcing her to writhe around at in the process. <laughs> forcing her to writhe around atop her frozen perch, unable to do anything but scream bloody murder. Murder. Bloody murder. Ah! 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 Reality slash! Reality slash! Reality slash! Well, that and watch in abject horror as the incomprehensible monstrosity that had barged through her front door systematically turned her people into strips. When only a few were left, 
It effortlessly leaped up to the cavern's improvised ramparts and got to work quickly and cleanly, snapping one neck after the other. Realizing it was saving her for the... Realizing it was saving her for last... ...and left leg in the process... <laughs> Realizing it was saving. Yes, our, uh, our audio quality on our app is better than Audible's. We, uh, you can stream and download 192 kilobytes per second files so i think that audible's top is 128 and to be honest every time i listen to something of ours on audible it makes me want to cry for last realizing it was saving her for last the woman did her best to crawl away but something grabbed her by the unsevered leg and slammed her into the quick Realizing it was saving her for last, the woman did her best to crawl away, but something grabbed her by the unsevered leg and slammed her into the cave wall. She fell onto the ice-coated rocky ground, coughing up blood and writhing in so much pain she was unsure which way was up. Back after the other. Realizing it was saving... Neck after the other. <laughs> Realizing it was saving her for last, the woman did her best to crawl away, but something grabbed her by the unsevered leg and slammed her into the cave wall. She fell onto the ice-coated rocky ground, coughing up blood and writhing in so much pain she was unsure which way was up. Blurry eyesight and ringing, <clears throat> blurry eyesight and ringing ears aside, there was no way she wouldn't notice that domineering figure loom over her broken body. It grabbed her by the throat and lifted her up into the air, forcing her to stare into those inhuman yellow orbs the doppelganger called eyes. It grabbed her by the throat and lifted her up into the air, forcing. Her her broken body. It grabbed her by the throat and lifted her up into the air, forcing her to stare into those in. Mind control! An oppressive wave crashed into the gang leader's shaky consciousness. She instinctively tried to fight it, but the fingers wrapped around her neck choked away any modicum of resistance. Even if she had ranked up into a werekin, as seen by the amplified ferocity of her feral features, the foxwoman could do little but crumble under the combined physical and mental pressure, putting what was left firmly under the monster's control. MIND CONTROL! <laughs> An oppressive wave crashed into the gang leader's shaky consciousness. She instinctively tried to fight it, but the fingers wrapped around her neck choked away any modicum of resistance. Even if she had ranked up into a werekin, as seen by the amplified ferocity of her feral features, the foxwoman could do little but crumble under the combined physical and mental pressure, putting what was left firmly under the monster's control. <clears throat> With the leader in such a state, Boxy asked where she kept certain illicit goods. The stuff it was after was quite the popular commodity within the criminal underworld. <coughs> the stuff, the stuff it was after was quite the popular commodity within the criminal underworld. Every two-bit thug knew about it, and most had dabbled in its. <coughs> the stuff it was, the stuff it was after was quite the popular commodity within the criminal underworld. Every two-bit thug knew about it, and most had dabbled in its trade. There was no way a smuggling... <coughs> Goddamn. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
there was no way a smuggling <clears throat> there was no way a smuggling ring there was no way a smuggling ring of this caliber wouldn't have there was no way a smuggling ring of this fuck there was no way a smuggling ring of this caliber wouldn't have some stored away sure enough the ringleader confirmed Sure enough. With the leader in such a state, Boxy... Sure enough, the ringleader confirmed that she was indeed in possession of the items Boxy had been seeking, an entire crates full at that. This was excellent news, primarily because it saved the shapeshifter the trouble of searching for more hideouts to raid. It wouldn't have to get... Excuse me. Tea, milk, uh, not milk, definitely not milk. Actually, there is milk in my tea a little bit, but that's only for, for flavor or for, you know, the taste. Um, honey and lemon also. It wouldn't have... It wouldn't have had to get its hands dirty at all if it had a bit more foresight, but it had forgotten to stock up on this stuff before leaving Velos and ran out in the middle of the long voyage. The shapeshifter had plenty the shapeshifter had plenty stashed in its lair, but the nearest access point to its dungeon network was at least two days' worth of travel away, even with its abnormal pace. Even with its abnormal pace. It wasn't a trip Kira could afford to make right now, hence the need to locate a local source. It thanked the werekin by crushing her neck and biting her face off, then went to fetch its prize. After completing its primary objective, Boxy scoured the hideout for anything else of value while simultaneously scrubbing it clean of any corpses or blood. A few gang members that had been out and about returned while it was doing that and were summarily added to the body count. And were summarily while it was doing that, and were out and about returned while it was doing. The once mimic briefly considered using cadaver absorption on the corpses, since there were quite a few good samples. But it decided against it. Its body was already at its current attribute limit. Any more, and it would start suffering from power creep again. It didn't want to repeat that thoroughly unpleasant attribute sapping ritual, so it chose to stick to the. Mo it didn't it didn't want to repeat it didn't want to repeat that thoroughly unpleasant attribute sapping ritual so it chose to stick to more menial not to mention tastier ways of cleaning up the evidence that said it did go back and stuff that ranked up ranger's corpse in a plus-sized ice box for later just in case all traces of its presence erased the shapeshifter collapsed the tunnels for good measure before returning triumphantly to the surface it donned its primary facade and started looking for the hotel Rowana had checked the two of them into. It quickly realized it would probably have been a good idea to set up some kind of meeting point before suddenly running off earlier. Then again, there were only three inns in the vicinity of Ambershore's docks, so it managed to find the right place without too much difficulty. SLAM!
I'm back! Kira declared as she barged into the room. Slam! Eek! Honey, I'm... The elf jumped in her desk seat. Oh, sweet Nairi, you startled me. Look what you made me do. <clears throat> she held up a letter she was writing before the sudden intrusion made her spill ink all over it. it. S sorry. I guess I got a bit over-enthusiastic. The Beastkin apologized. Honestly. Well, I hope this means you're feeling better. The cat girl nodded and smiled in such a sweet manner that it almost gave Rowana a toothache. The cat girl nodded and smiled in such a sweet manner that it almost gave Rowana a toothache. Yep, told you I just needed to have a good run. <laughs> and to think you used to complain so much about doing laps. The platinum blonde elf felt relief wash over her. The platinum blonde elf felt relief wash over her blissfully unaware that the reason for her girlfriend's giddy mood was most definitely not a runner's high. Boom, and that is a chapter. What are we at? 35-minute chapter. So we're an hour and 10 minutes in, and we're already at 13%. This is a relatively short... E-L-L-C. What did you misspell, Tristan? All right, I'm going to start a new pot of tea. Take a tiny little break here. Um, thanks again for coming, guys. And uh, don't forget, if you want more Neven Ilyev, if you uh, are listened all the way up on Everybody Loves Large Chests and you want to try something new, um, we do have the spinoff of Everybody Loves Large Chests called Small Chests Are Fine 2. Um, that classic audiobook and full cinematic audio series are both on our platform, um, available to purchase. Um, and I'm really proud of those products. Um, Dory Sachs is the narrator, and she replaces me as Fizzy in this series, and she does an amazing time, uh, an amazing job. Um, I think Fizzy is better off for it. And also from Neven Ilyev, there is The Stars Have Eyes. It's a completely different story. It's set in the third British, British Empire in space, um, a giant colony of English people. And uh, basically the concept is, what if Cthulhu was your girlfriend? And um, although that concept does sound kind of crazy and like it could be violent and horrific, it's actually adorable and heartfelt and very human. So um, it, it, it is actually a romantic comedy and, it, and it's amazing. It's super good. Um, I, that's probably my second favorite production we've ever done as far as cinematic audio so far. Um, really great music, really great sound effects. Love it. Um, so if you haven't already, check out Neven Ilyev's Stars Have Eyes on our website. Um, it is a complete 180 from Everybody Loves Large Chests, whereas ELLC is uh, about a sociopathic box, you know, going on a gigantic murder spree. The Stars Have Eyes is very much um, just about a guy looking for love. So um, anyway, I'm going to go make some more tea and I'll be back soon.
Yes, also Legends of Arenia, also DCC1. You guys, or DCC uh, Audio Immersion Tunnel. Go pick up all of our free stuff, guys. There's plenty. There's plenty for you guys to check out and uh, series to, to pick up. It's all, um, man, we keep, we keep adding so much stuff, and our library is becoming pretty big now. Um, yeah, how's everybody doing? Hope you all are having a good time. Big Buddha asks, how long do you think this book will be? Ten hours? I think it's going to be more like nine. Maybe nine fifteen. Um, if you just got done reading uh, Teresa Otaku, then... Actually, you're at the perfect spot. Oh, uh, well, no, Teresa, do, go one more, do, uh, do Mortimer and then do Scaft. <sighs> I can't wait to work on more Naven Ilyev stuff, though. Um, have you guys been reading, um... Ursus Ex Machina. Because that one's a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to working on that. Um, and then there's his other... His other story... Gosh, what is it called? I got... Oh, shit! Of course I did. Every single time... Every single time I put my tea... On this surface, I spill it. Bag of rice. It's fine. I didn't, uh, I only barely hit my keyboard. It was my stream deck that got the most of it, but I think it'll be all right. I do need a sicky. I do need a sippy cup. By the way, uh, just a couple more things. We have some new releases on Audible. Uh, we have, let's see here. We have Dungeon in the Clouds, 
Um, that one is written by a new author, Daniel Weber. It's a, it's a cool new dungeon core. And it's from the series called Rise of Curs and published by Portal. And this is narrated by Justin Thomas James with me as a backup, as a, one of the characters at least. Uh, Dory Sachs and Annie Ellicott doing female voices. We have Mimic and Me, which is um, uh, sort of a different type of Mimic story. It's It actually reminds me more of Venom than it reminds me of Everybody Loves Large Chests. But uh, that's narrated by our new guy, Ryan Reed. And um, Dory Sachs is the female characters, and I am the Mimic. Uh, and then we also have um, Tivaga's The Chosen Two, which is book two of the Prophecy Approved Companion series. Love that series. I'm so disappointed that it's not doing better because it's amazing. Um, I don't know what it is that people uh, are not... Are not jiving with but it's there and it's ready for your consumption if you haven't listened to book one already you definitely should annie ellicott is the narrator of that where and uh gary furlong plays the main character um and uh i play a sewer bard in it so uh yeah those are our newest releases on audible if you guys want to go check that out all of those are lit rpgs And uh, here goes. We're going to go to part two of chapter one. <clears throat> part two. I forgot what this guy is like. Okay. We're almost there, everyone! The stagecoach driver, the stagecoach driver yelled to his passengers. You might want to get your things in order! Though the man did his best to sound chipper, his unease showed in his voice. This was doubtlessly one of the weirdest jobs he had ever taken, and he was looking forward to finishing it and getting out of here as quickly as possible. Even though he was no stranger to ferrying people deep into the Empire, there were certain things the simple man just couldn't ignore. The first was his imminent destination, the foreboding fortress of Aenor Keep. Calling its history spotty would be an understatement of heretical proportions. It started as an internment camp for slaves before growing into a full-on prison complex. Laboratory facilities were later added to facilitate some less-than-ethical experiments on the Empire's dregs. It eventually became a stronghold of the infamous Order of the Black Wand until hundreds of its taboo holders lost their lives in a massive massacre. While often attributed to the Hero of Death, Cleaning House, the event remained shrouded in mystery and didn't exactly alleviate the location's terrible reputation. The place seemed cursed to forever be steeped in despair and misery, and the way its black spires and walls seemed to loom overhead certainly reinforced the idea. And the way, 
and the way its black spires and walls seemed to loom overhead certainly reinforced that idea. Let's see here. Um... Often attributed to the hero of death. So, eminent versus imminent. I don't know if this is the correct word. Famous and respected within a particular sphere of profession. No. So, imminent is correct. About to happen. Got it. All right. and the way it's misery and the way it's black spire it's that idea Yet, the Imperial Inquisition did not seem bothered by dark rumors and grim stories in the slightest. When the Order of the Black Wand fell apart following the aforementioned massacre, the creepy castle was eventually handed over to Teresa's zealots. And then, rather than tear it down like any reasonable human being, they actually moved in. They even made it their headquarters, the seat of the Grand Inquisitor himself. Anor Keep was apparently in a logistically convenient location, but such details went above the head of a simple stagecoach driver like Michael. From his perspective, he could not fathom how or why anyone would willingly live in a place with such a gloomy atmosphere and troubled history. However, as creepy as the destination... However, as creepy as the destination was, what made the trip truly bizarre were Michael's passengers. Oh, we got here rather fast, didn't we? Nice work, Mikey. Uh, we go. Ugh, such a dreadful place. I will never understand why humans like these drafty-looking castles so much. This coming from someone that lives in a treehouse hundreds of meters up in the air? <clears throat> All right, we need a snack. We need a snack track. Snack? Never in his wildest dreams would he imagine himself ferrying a beastkin hero, her lesbian elven lover, a civilized mithril golem, a sentient bracelet, and a living jewelry box all the way to an Inquisition stronghold. He wouldn't have taken the job at all, but he made a rick... <clears throat> he wouldn't have taken the job at all, but he made a rookie mistake of not confirming all the details first. Like most guys, beautiful women were a w like most guys, beautiful women were a weakness of his, and he couldn't say no to the platinum blonde hottie in the revealing white dress. By the time he realized what sort of ridiculous menagerie he was going to be transporting, it was already too late. Agreements were signed and money had changed hands, so his guild would have had his head. Agreements were signed, and money had changed hands, so his guild would have his head if he backed out. To make matters worse, the woman he had his eye on turned out both spoken for and not a fan of men. On the bright side, the deal was for a one-way trip, so he wouldn't have to worry about this crazy bunch much longer. Will you ladies be needing anything else? 
Are things in order? Will you ladies be needing anything else? Thoughts of his impending freedom helped him maintain a professional tone of... Thoughts of his impending freedom helped him maintain a professional tone of voice, even though he'd been on pins and needles the entire journey. No, we're good, Kira responded. Just give us a minute to unload our stuff. <sighs> of course, madam. A few minutes later, Michael was speeding off in the direction he came from, Counting his lucky stars, the job ended without him getting dragged into some ridiculous hijinks. Without him getting dragged into some rid A few minutes later, Michael was speeding off in the direction he came from. Counting his lucky stars, the job ended without him getting dragged into some ridiculous hijinks. Just gotta make some marks here. The Inquisition sentries had spotted the group disembarking at the end of the short path that connected the fort's main gate to the highway. The Inquisition sentries had spotted the group disembarking at the end of the short path that connected the fort's main gate to the highway, so it was only natural they'd send someone to investigate. A lot of someone's, actually, judging by the twenty or so armed guards approaching Kira and the others. The one in charge was easy enough to spot as he was the soldier with the fanciest hat and was walking front and center in front of his subordinates. Well, who goes there? Who goes there? the man in charge called out to them. Kira Morgana, Hero of Chaos, the redhead curtly answered. I'm just going to leave that out. I'm here on behalf of your boss. She showed the soldier a palm-sized circular medal engraved with the image of an eye surrounded by various religious icons pertaining to Teresa's faith. A few of the grunts let out surprised gasps and murmurs when they recognized the grand in A few of the grunts let out surprised gasps and murmur A few of the grunts let out surprised gasps and murmurs when they recognized the Grand Inquisitor's seal of authority, but their commanding officer silenced them with quick over the shoulder But their But their commanding officer silenced them with a quick over the shoulder glare. Oh, looks like Get some focus going on here. There we go. Authority, but their authority, but their commanding officer silenced them with a quick over the shoulder glare. Faith. A few of the grunts let out surprised gasps and murmurs and murmurs when they recognized the Grand Inquisitor's pertaining to Teresa's faith. A few of the grunts let out pertaining to Teresa's faith. A few of the grunts let out Teresa's faith. A few of the grunts let out Teresa's faith. No, I don't think it is. A few of the grunts let out.
Teresa's faith. No, I no way. Way. I think it is. A few of the grunts let out shoulder glare. Who goes there? Of course, we've been expecting you. Of course, we've been expecting you. Of course, we've been expecting you. Yeah. You have? Indeed, our resident cardinal received an oracle from Lady Teresa saying you would be arriving soon. Ah, I see. The cat girl nodded. What happens now, then? Now I must ask you to follow me inside, madam. You lot, help these fine ladies with their luggage. They are honored guests of the Inquisition, so I won't tolerate any slack or lip. The soldiers respectfully escorted their visitors to the gatehouse and, after a customary appraisal check, allowed them to pass through. The fort's courtyard was brimming with activity as new and veteran recruits practiced formations, performed drills, and knelt in circles as they joined in collective prayer. A few glanced at the pass A few glanced at the passing strangers, but nobody dared step out of line. It was rather impressive how disciplined and serious everyone was, especially considering their top brass were currently across the ocean. across the ocean. therefore seemed quite surreal when they saw a blonde girl in casual clothing rush over to meet them with a goofy smile. Hey there, I'm Maddie. She introduced herself. You must be Cousin Kira. Uh, cousin? 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 The three guests exclaimed in unison. Hmm? Was I wrong? Uh, well, my name is Kira, but we're definitely not related. That was an understatement to understate all understatements. <clears throat> to begin with, this strange girl was clearly not a beastkin. She looked markedly human, around 16 to 17 years old. She had fair skin, straight, golden blonde hair that fell down her back to her waist, a charmingly beautiful face, and a bubbly attitude. She wore a long, vibrant green skirt, a plain leather corset, and a white, short-sleeved shirt so unbuttoned it... Damn. She had fair... She had fair skin and a bubbly attitude. She wore... She wore a long, vibrant green skirt, a plain leather corset... Oh... She wore a long, vibrant green skirt, a plain leather corset, and a white, short-sleeved shirt so unbuttoned it ex- Fuck. 
She wore a long, vibrant green skirt, a plain leather corset, and a white, short-sleeved shirt so unbuttoned it exposed both her cleavage and her aversion to bras. She was fifteen to twenty centimeters shorter than the beastkin, putting... <clears throat> she was... She was fifteen to twenty centimeters shorter than the beastkin, putting her at around one-fifty. Visually, the only parts of her that seemed even remotely similar to Kira were the relative proportions of her hips, waist, and bust, though such figures weren't all that uncommon. What was abnormal were her eyes. The bright green of her irises glowed with a piercing inner light that was noticeable in daylight and clearly visible in complete darkness. That was the second hint most people would get that she wasn't human. The first, far more obvious one, was the ribbed, pointed, upcurved, bone-like horn that protruded from the top of her forehead, just below the hairline. Boxy immediately recognized the resemblance of these two traits. Boxy. Boxy immediately recognized the resemblance of these two traits, leaving no doubt in its mind that this was one of the triplets sired by its many-armed minion. Unfortunately, this deduction did little to explain where that cousin comment came from. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean that literally, silly. <laughs> Maddie said with a light giggle. It's just that since I figured you were kind of like my mom's brother's adopted daughter, we're basically cousins. It's just that, since I figured you were kind of like my mom's brother's adopted daughter, we're basically cousins. M mom's brother's what now? Rowana asked with a profoundly confused expression. <sighs> now, now, she's just a bit mixed up. Kira stepped forward. Maddie, was it? Why don't we go over there for a bit so we can have a quick chat? Clear up misunderstandings and whatnot. She grabbed the ditzy blonde by the arm and ushered her towards the nearest building. The girl allowed herself to be dragged off without raising a fuss, though the same could not be said of Kira's betrothed. And whatnot? Oh. Ow. She grabbed. Betrothed. Betrothed. Sweetie, where are you going? The elf called out to her. Hero business, honey. Nothing to worry about. You there, Tin Face. Hero business, honey. Nothing to worry about. You there, Tin Face. Do me a favor and get my friends someplace where they can rest, would you? It was a long trip. Understood. Our visitors all is right this way, Miss Sly. The officer in charge of the welcoming party obviously disliked being called Tin Face but couldn't dispute the bucket-like aspects of his headgear. Um, so is this supposed to be the same guy, then? Same guy from before? They are honored guests of the Inquisition, so I won't talk... 
Will you ladies be- Subordinates. Who goes there? The man in charge called out to the others. The one in charge was easy enough to spot, as he was the soldier with the fanciest hat and was walking front and center in front of his subordinates. Oh, okay. Understood. Uh, understood. Uh, visitor's Hall is right this way, Miss Sly. The off. Miss Slyth. The way, Miss Slyth. The officer in charge of the welcoming party obviously disliked being called Tin. More importantly, anyone who bore the Grand Inquisitor seal was automatically his superior officer. It was a symbol of authority far above his station, so he was duty-bound to consider those words an order from the hero of the hammer himself. Plus, he was one of the few people who knew that Maddie and her sisters truly were. Plus, 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 he was one of the few people who knew what Maddie and her sisters truly were, so he understood why some discretion was necessary. He did not let out a single peep of complaint. He did not let out a single peep of complaint as he escorted Rowana, Fizzy, and the pet mimics to the guest room. Meanwhile, Kira dragged Maddie into an out-of-the-way corner, then shoved her against the wall and grabbed her by the collar. Meanwhile, Kira dragged Maddie into an out-of-the-way corner, then shoved... Now listen here, Cupcake, the cat girl growled at her. The cat girl growled at her. My girlfriend has no idea about your freaky lineage, and I want to make sure it stays that way. As far as she's concerned, you're just a regular girl with a few unfortunate deformities. I don't care who your mama is. You say anything about gods or demons around her, and I will rip your fucking tongue out and shove it down your throat. You understand me? The flabbergasted woman could do little but look up at the taller redhead with tears welling up in her eyes, lips quivering as her throat failed to make a sound. <clears throat> you understand me? The flabbergasted woman... The flabbergasted woman could do little but look up at... Me? <laughs> the flabbergasted woman could do little but look up at the taller redhead with tears... I said... Fuck off. I said... Do I make myself clear? Someone butted in before the customary frantic nodding or terrified, yes ma'am, could be conveyed. Get off. Get off her, you creep! Get off her, you creep!
The cat girl glared over her shoulder at the interloper, a muscle-bound woman that looked like a humanized version of Cora. Her appearance and attitude made it painfully obvious she was another of the Archfiend's offspring. She strode over, put one hand on Kira's shoulder, and was about to take a swing with her other only... She strode over... She strode over... She strode over, put one hand on Kira's shoulder, and was about to take a swing with her other own. She strode over, put one hand on Kira's shoulder, and was about to take a swing with her other, only to suddenly find herself looking down at the grass and dirt she was standing on moments prior. God damn it, I don't need this in Spanish! The hell? She had barely even gotten a chance to grasp where she was before her face slammed against the ground. She tried to get up right away, but Kira climbed on top of her, held her hands behind her waist, and pressed her foot against the back of the muscle brain's skull, giving her no recourse but to stay down. Slammed against the ground. <laughs> She tried to get up right away, but Kira climbed on top of her, held her hands behind her waist, and pressed her foot against the back of the muscle brain's skull, giving her no recourse but to stay down. <laughs> Great. Another one. The cat girl grumbled. <clears throat> the cat girl grumbled, then shot a glare towards the last blonde-haired woman at the scene. The cat girl grumbled, then shot a glare towards the last blonde-haired woman at the scene. <sighs> I take it you must be sister number three? Indeed, I am. Indeed, I am. Indeed, I am. She answered coldly. Now, could I ask you to release Robin? I know she's an impulsive idiot, but there's surely no need for violence. Sure there is! Sure there is! <laughs> sure there is! I just need to use more of it! Just... Get off of me! Oh, <laughs> sure there is! I just need to use more of it! Just... Get off of me! Yes. The one on the ground... <clears throat> yes. The one on the ground complained... I just need... Yes. The one on the ground complained...
complained. As much as she struggled, the one called Robin could not hope to throw Kira off. Foxy wasn't even using its full strength to keep her pinned. Despite her heavy and well-defined muscles, this meathead was completely outclassed by the facade's supposed attributes and skills in every aspect except for girth and cockiness. <laughs> Great. Another one. <laughs> she had barely eaten against the ground. She tried to get Hey there, I'm... You must be Cousin Kira. Cousin... Cousin. You must be Cousin Kira. Hmm? <clears throat> oh, heavens, that was exciting. Madeline quickly... Madeline suddenly exclaimed while clutching her chest... I've never been threatened like that before. I think I almost peed myself a little. And the way you spun Robin around like it was nothing, it was incredible. Uh, what the? Wasn't she bullying you? Incredible. Bullying you. the pinned one said. You! The pinned one Don't be silly! Cousin Kiro was simply clearing up a misunderstanding! You need to smush both sides. Uh, what the? Wasn't she bullying you? The pin. Yeah, I think it's all right, but maybe I, I will smush both for next next one. Ending. Robin. Robin finally settled down when she heard that name. I... I see. So, that's what it was. Uh, I'm sorry for losing my temper. Now get the fu- uh, I mean, could you please let me go?
she blurted out awkwardly. Ah, uh, I'm sorry for losing my temper. Now get the fu- uh, Could you please let me go? Name. I... I see, so... And when she heard that name... I... I see, so... That's what... It, that name... I... I see, so... That's what it was. She blurted out... Was... She blurted out awkwardly... Ah... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry for losing my temper. Now get the fu- uh, I mean, could you please let me go? Yeah. She's on her face. It's all right. We don't want it to be, be too muffled, because then it's hard to understand. But I also don't want to, like, go back and redo all those when it's fine. Yeah, you can hear my beard. <laughs> I think it'll I think it'll come across as like dirt though. We'll see. <gasps> All right. But try anything funny and you'll be eating a second helping of dirt. It took a few minutes and a bit of apologizing, but the situation calmed down enough for the girls to discuss. It took a few minutes and a bit of apologizing, but the situation calmed down enough for the girls to discuss things like rational adults. The third and most level-headed of the triplets led them inside the main keep and into a more private space, away from prying eyes and ears. from prying eyes and ears. It seemed to be their sleeping quarters, as the personal effects strewn about looked far too civilian for a soldier's bedroom. Well, apart from the bulky suit of armor in the corner, which seemed to be Robin's judging by the size of it, the three blonde-haired women lined up in the middle of the room and stood in front of Kira. Right, I suppose self-introductions are well overdue, the one on the far right said. My name is Lydia. My name is Lydia. I am an apprentice priest, and the one burdened with keeping these two in line and on task. She looked almost identical to Maddie. Almost being the operative word there, as Lydia seemed to suffer from a severe case of resting bitch face. She also wore her golden hair in a tidy ponytail tied off with a red string opposed to Maddie's long, straight mane. Another similarity was the horn jutting out of Lydia. Another similarity. <clears throat> Another similarity was the horn jutting out of Lydia's skull, though hers was on the left side of her head just above the ear. She was wearing a shoulderless dark blue robe with a gold trim and a near black sleeveless undershirt that showed off none of her skin or cleavage. It was significantly more modest than Madeline's tavern wench like outfit, perhaps even formal. I apologize again on behalf of my sisters. She gracefully bowed her head. They've always been rather excitable, and news of your arrival has them amped up. Oh, loosen up, sis, Maddie chirped. We were just having a bit of fun. Dup. Aw, oh, loosen up, sis, Maddie chirped. We were just having a bit of fun. She threw her left hand around her stern sister's waist, pulling her closer in a manner that didn't seem very... sisterly. Watch it, Madeline. Lydia warned. 
Lydia coldly warned her. You're invading my personal space again. Also, you're the one that needs to straighten up the most. All you do is goof off and play with your loot. At least Robin tries to keep up with her training and studies. Whew, yeah, fat load of good that did me. Whew, yeah, fat load of good that did me. The third one grumbled. I got thrown about like a sack of flour out there. I got thrown about like a sack of flour out there. Training in studies. Whew, yeah, fat load of good there. Thanks, Matt. Hey, Matt's Fantasy Book Reviews is back in the chat. Did he, uh, oh, he just, he just left that. Thanks for coming back. Appreciate it. The last of the siblings stood out the most. She had the same basic facial structure and shared their skin, hair, and eye colors, but seemed as though she had inherited most of her demonic parents' traits. She was definitely built like a fiend, which made her noticeably taller and wider than the others. She also wore her long hair in the same wild and untamed style as Cora. Her outfit was the most unrefined and masculine of the bunch. She had a short-sleeved crop-top shirt that showed off her well-defined abs and rippling biceps. She wore a pair of plain brown trousers held in place by an equally unremarkable belt. She had her fists and forearms wrapped in off-white bandages, suggesting that she inherited Cora's love of punching things in addition to her physique and hot-headedness. On the whole, on the whole, while Maddie looked like a loose village girl and Lydia gave off the feeling of an uptight librarian, it was impossible to describe Robin as anything other than a thug. Pretty, but a thug nonetheless. As for her horn, it was on the right side of her head, directly opposite of Lydia's. I wish I could show you guys the picture, but I for again, I forgot to connect my Google Chrome to, or give my Google Chrome permission to stream things, so I gotta do it, like, tomorrow, I'm back at it, I may even get started as early as 10, we'll see, but, um, tomorrow, I'll be back at it, and I will definitely do it this time, and if someone could please, again, remind me before the stream is over to, um, to restart Chrome so that I can give it permissions, so that I can share these pictures tomorrow, I'd appreciate it. Ooh, wait, hold on a second, Kira mumbled while looking at Kira mumbled while looking at all three bony appendages in turn. Gotta give Annie direction. Um You said your names were Lydia, Madeline, and Robin? <laughs> you said your names were Lydia, Madeline, and Robin? I wonder if this joke is going to come across in audio. It's not on the Discord, unfortunately. Um, let's see. Indeed. Uh, indeed. The first of those confirmed. And who was it that gave you those? Uncle Sigmund, of course. The middle one happily revealed. Huh. Did he ever say why he chose those for you? Uh, dunno. The muscular sibling shrugged. Never really thought about it. Why do you ask? Lydia inquired. Is there something wrong with our names? Well, I just 
couldn't help but notice something. Kira held a hand up to the left side of her scalp in what seemed like an imitation of the trio's horns. Lydia? She then moved it to the middle of her forehead. Madeline? Then finally mirrored the initial gesture with her right hand. Robin? gesture with her right hand. Robin! She repeated the sequence once more, though that did not seem to dispel the girl's shared confusion. I'm afraid I don't follow. <laughs> you look cute when you do that. I don't know what you're talking about either, but I have been told I'm a bit thick. Follow. <laughs> all right, I'm going to blend all these so that they're talking over each other a little bit. I don't follow. <laughs> you look cute when you do that. I don't know what you're talking about either, but I have been told I'm a bit thick. You know what, never mind. The cat girl gave up. I'm probably just imagining things. She didn't know Law well enough to judge whether he intentionally gave them names with initials that matched the position of their horns, nor would it change anything if he did. More importantly, we should compare notes. Lydia, you seem the least stupid. So can you tell me what you three know of your own circumstances? The singled-out sister let out a deep sigh before she addressed the blunt-as-bricks query. The singled-out sister let out a deep sigh before she addressed the blunt-as-bricks query. <sighs> we are Nephilim, born from the union between Teresa, the goddess of truth and justice, and the demon called Coralenta Prixquath. Damn it. <coughs> We are Nephilim, born from the union between Teresa, the goddess of truth and justice, and the demon called Coralentaprix, Chaothix, Cathed... Damn it, I swear I had her name down. Damn it, I swear I had her name down. Damn it, I swear I had her name down. Down focus, Lydia. <clears throat> of course, my apologies. But yes, we are aware that our mother is a goddess, our father is a demon, and our great-great-great-grandfather is your patron. And our great-great-great-grandfather... And, and our great-great-great-grandfather is your patron. And does that lineage give you any special powers or divine gifts I need to keep in mind? Surprisingly, not much. We can see in the dark, but that's about it. Apparently, Mother's divinity and Father's demonhood cancelled each other out for the most part. Or so we've been told. In other words, despite their fantastical heritage, the Nephilim did not seem to have a predisposition. The Nephilim, the Nephilim did not seem to have a, the Nephilim did not seem to have a predisposition towards good or evil, at least no more or less than other enlightened races.
We did get a bunch of blessings from some of Mom's friends, though. We... We, we did get a bunch of blessings from some of Mom's friends, though. No. Madeline inter... Madeline interjected. Damn it. Madeline interjected. Damn it. Blah, blah, blah. Madeline interjected. Nairies. Nairies was how he managed to grow up so fast. The grace of the goddess of fertility had made their minds and bodies undergo accelerated development, allowing them to become fully-fledged adults in as little as two years. They could read, write, do basic arithmetic, and had a wealth of general knowledge thanks to Lunar's boon. Nope. They could read... They could read, write, do basic arithmetic, and had a... They could read, write, do basic arithmetic, and had a wealth of general knowledge thanks to Lunar's boon. However, they lacked any real-world experience since their rapid growth had been under the watchful eye of Sigmund Law. That was where the Hero of Chaos came in. It was Boxy's job to teach them the harsh realities of what awaited them outside their gilded cage and prepare them for the hardships the first of the Nephilim would surely face. There was no telling how the world would react once news of a new race spread, so they had to be prepared for anything. Fuck shit! Fucking liquids, guys. Liquids are the enemy. Got a little bit. Just got got a little bit everywhere. I think I need a coaster up here so that sliding around shit doesn't happen. Um, one problem with my setup is that is the I have basically two desks in front of me, in one. Um, again, dude. Yeah, I know. Um, this time it was on the upper desk, which is usually safe, but the problem with the upper desk is that uh, it's kind of like hanging in space a little bit, and my monitors are both are on this thing, they're on this mount, and they're both pretty heavy, so they're, they're bringing, like, they're tilting the desk down a little bit, so now I have, like, a ramp coming down. It's not like, it's not a steep ramp, it's like that you know but it's still things will still slide on it so yeah i need a coaster up here it's like a coke commercial for anything Wait, aren't you girls forgetting about that dreaming thing? Robin reminded the others. I'm pretty sure that counts as a special power. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that counts as a special power. Uh, dreaming thing? What are you talking about? Well, sometimes we get these lucid dreams where we float through this weird place without any shapes, but full of people. I think Uncle Sigmund called it the beyond. Wait, wait, wait. You can visit the beyond? It's not a bad spill. It's just some droplets here and there. <clears throat> Boxy accidentally let its surprise slip through its facade. Though anyone with any... Though anyone with even a casual understanding of demonology would have a similar reaction. <laughs> it is uh, difficult to describe. Lydia took over. However, we are not really visiting so much as peeking in. The demons on the other side are able to sense our presence and often talk to us, though they are quite rude. 
Yeah, we even got to see Daddy a few times. It's so fucking funny that they call her Daddy. <laughs> Rude. Yeah, we even got to see Daddy a few times. <laughs> oh, shit. The situation is just so... Uh. <clears throat> Madeline declared. Madeline declared joyfully. Can't wait to meet her in person. She said you could make that happen, so I've been totally excited ever since I heard you were dropping by. <laughs> Boxy internally cursed that loud-mouthed fiend. Caleb Campbell says, jokes like that make the series worth it. I agree. Boxy internally cursed that loud-mouthed fiend. According to Adrian, these three had no... These... According to Adrian, these three had no idea who the Hero of Chaos truly was. If they did, there was no way any of these whelps would be able to converse with its facade so casually. Plus, Teresa would likely have a lot of explaining to do. Long story short, it was better for literally everyone involved if this secret was kept. Which was why that blockhead saying such unnecessary things through some cross-dimensional dream link needed to stop effective immediately. The shapeshifter would send Benjamin a... The shapeshifter would send Benjamin a strongly worded message later. The shapeshifter would send Benjamin a strongly worded message later. Right now, it had a situation to handle. I'm not sure about that, the creature feigned ignorance. What does this daddy of yours even look like? Big, strong, three horns, kind of like ours combined. Big, strong, three horns, kind of like ours combined. <laughs> Robin gestured at her head. She's going to need more than that, you dolt. She's going to need more than that, you dolt. Lydia reprimanded her. Father is a female fiend with six arms, red skin, and bright green hair and eyes. Father is a female fiend with six arms, red skin, and bright green hair and eyes. Oh. Oh! The redhead faked realization. Does she shout, Ora, a lot? Does she shout, Ora, a lot? Daddy? Madeline bounced in place.
Uh, we're acquainted, yes. I can arrange a meeting once we get you three to Azurevale. Speaking of which, if this cultural exchange is to be effective, I have to ask you three a question. Arguably the biggest question you'll ever have to tackle. The triplet's attitude turned deadly serious in response to Kira's tone. Even the middle one wiped that bubbly smirk off her face, replacing it with a tight-lipped expression. It's something you might spend your entire lives seeking an answer for. If you think you have one now, it might not be the right one. But I want to hear it anyway. If you don't, then mull it over on the trip. Understood? The trio nodded and waited for the redhead to continue. What do you want to do with your life? There was but a brief pause of barely a few seconds for that to sink in before Robin impatiently spoke up. Dump. I want to be a knight and bash bad guys, she declared with a fierce grin. I want to smash their faces in to avenge all the pain they caused innocent bystanders. Ocump. I want to be a knight and ba- Ocump. I want to be a knight and bash bad guys, she declared with a- Ocump. I want to be a knight and bash bad guys, she declared with a- Bad guys, she declared with a- She declared with a fierce grin. <clears throat> I want to smash their faces in to avenge all the pain they caused innocent bystanders. You know, just like Uncle Sigmund. I... I don't want to fight at all, to be honest, Madeline said with a pout. I don't want to fight at all, to be honest, Madeline. Sigmund, I don't want to fight at all, to be honest, Madeline said. I want to be a bard and inspire people with my songs. I want to create, not destroy. I want to have babies. I want to have babies. Roy, I want to have babies. Lydia casually proclaimed, lots and lots of babies. At least 517. Lots and lots of babies. At least 517. At least 517. At least 517. Babies. At least 517. The other two rolled their eyes and groaned with an air of, Here we go again, while Kira was thoroughly confused. The left-horned one seemed the left-horned one seemed the most normal of the trio, so this insane plan gen the, the left-horned one seemed the most normal of the trio, so this insane plan genuinely caught her off guard. East 517. Ah. Uh. Seventeen. Seventeen. Oh, not this again. The other two. Oh, not this again. The other two rolled the. Seventeen. Oh, not this again. Why the other two here? rolled their eyes. The other two rolled their eyes and genuinely caught her off guard. Uh, okay? The stupefied beastkin replied. Don't give me that look. 
We are the first of our kind. It is our duty to procreate as much as possible for the sake of the Nephilim race. Since these two are doing everything they can to run away from that responsibility, it falls on me to ensure that our lineage doesn't end with us. No, I get that. But what's with that number? Oh, I read a study that said 520 was the minimum number of people necessary to secure a stable and diverse population. You do know it's physically impossible for three women to birth that many children in their lifetime, right? Divine blessings, remember? I estimate our bodies can go from conception to childbirth. I, I estimate our bodies can go from conception to childbirth in as little as ten weeks. Frankly speaking, we should all be heavy with our third babies by now, but Sigmund refuses to breed us for some unknown reason. Frankly, frankly speaking, we should all be heavy with our third bit. Frankly speaking, we should all be heavy with our third babies by now, but Sigmund refuses to breed us for some unknown reason. Lydia, the guy raised us. Unknown reason. Lydia, the guy raised us. Robin pointed out. He's been more of a dad to us than our actual dad. He's been more of a dad to us than our actual dad. Then why did he have to order all of the men stationed here to never lay a hand on us? Dad. Then why did he have to order all of the men stationed here to never lay a hand on us? Lydia retorted. Look, Kira, bottom line is I'm counting on you to find a suitable mate for me. Ideally multiple and for all of us. Men with strong bodies, sharp wits, noble spirits, and kind hearts. You know, sis, you don't need some big burly man. You know, sis, you don't need some big burly man. Madeline cooed as she pulled Lydia closer. You could always let me try to put a bun in that oven of yours. Ah! <laughs> Madeline, we've been over this. You lack the... Uh, equipment. We all do. Madeline, we've been over this. You lack the, uh, equipment. We all do. So? We're like the products of a miracle. Who says a second one can't happen if we do it hard enough? Who says a, who says a second one can't happen if we do it hard enough? <sighs> ah! Miracle. Who says a second one can't happen if we do it hard enough? Nature does you dimwit. Kira, talk some sense into her, will you? Hard enough. <sighs> Nature does you dimwit. <laughs> However, Kira was currently out of it, as Boxy was busy lamenting its terrible luck. Just once, it wanted to meet a person that wasn't obsessed with their genitals. Granted, it was almost inevitable these siblings would have inherited some kinks, but it had quietly hoped that wouldn't be the case. At the very least, incestuous desires were easier to cover up than literal murder-fucking, but it still hated that it had to do... 
but it still hated that it had to deal with this for the umpteenth time. Thankfully, Jen's libido, if she ever had one, had dried up long ago. Otherwise, it was extremely likely she would have turned into another pervert the shapeshifter had to keep happy. <gasps> ah! Whoops. Then, in a room with one sister trying to seduce another while the third glared at them with a look of utter disgust, Boxy realized something. It was supposed to check on how that Griffin Harpy hybrid. It was supposed to check on how that Griffin Harpy hybrid was doing four days ago. All right, and that will be. My cold read for today. Thank you guys so much for coming and hanging out. I need to go get some lunch, um, but I really appreciate all of your support. I hope that you guys had a fun time while you were here. I'm back at it tomorrow, 11 a.m. at the earliest, but I'm going to try for 10. And this is central, by the way. Um, and don't forget, guys, make sure to try out the uh, Dungeon Crawler Carl audio immersion tunnel. First first episode is free. It is available. And the rest of the season is available for pre-order as well. We have also, if you want uh, the spin-off for Everybody Loves Large Chests, Small Chests Are Fine too. that is completely available on our website and on our website only. The classic audiobook as well as the cinematic audio. We also have The Stars Have Eyes, another Neven Ilyev story. It's actually a romantic comedy and completely a 180 from this depraved ass bullshit. And, um, I'd say that's just about it for now. You guys have a fantastic day, and hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can check the description uh, of in, in, uh, below this video for links and stuff for, for things that you want. And, uh, yeah, tomorrow, 11 a.m. Central at the latest. Watch out. Y'all have a good night. Bye-bye.